It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I'm Kate. I'm Dan. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you? Real good. Good to hear. So, you want to just get right into it? Let's just dive right into it. We are a podcast that likes to talk about movies. We love going into production stories, and then after we watch the movies, we'll talk about some of the tropes that uh, hit them. Kate, what are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about 1993 American musical adventure comedy, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. That is quite a qualification, a... a it's, it's hyper-specific. It, it is. American musical comedy. Adventure comedy. Adventure comedy. But realistically, which word from there would you lose? Adventure. Robin Hood is always an adventure. Well, I mean, but if we have to pick one... I would say probably American, because it's supposed to be in England, but... Good point. So you might be asking, Kate. This is far from the most famous or box office successful movie for Mel Brooks. Why this one? Kate, this is far from the most successful uh, box office success for Mel Brooks. Why this one? Well, my dearest and dear listeners, as I think most people and some admitted other folks who maybe only acknowledged it in more recent years, I have had a major Hollywood crush on star Carrie Elwes dating back to The Princess Bride which we're absolutely covering in the future. And I fully recognize that there are tons of hugely successful Mel Brooks movies, but Ben and Tights is a sentimental favorite of mine because my then much stronger crush on Carrie Elwes really carried it. He's had a couple of missteps in his career since then. We're not going to let me rant about the mess. Mm, Yeah, or the mess that Hollywood made of Ella Enchanted. But this was one of the first movies that young me specifically sought out to find the actor's real name oh. instead of being like, oh, yeah, that guy from that movie. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, do you remember that? Um, oh, what is his name? He was in that movie. You know. Um, uh, he has that kind of sandy, you know, brownish, blondish hair. Yeah. He, he, um Probably Blue Eyes. Yeah, I think so. Oh, um, what is his? He was, he was in, in mm, that movie, you know, with the other guy. Yeah, you know, he was he was in that one movie with um with Robin Williams. You know that that one Robin Williams movie. Yeah, 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 with, yeah, yeah. with the co-star. Of course. Yeah. Yes, I know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had that qualifier because I at the time obviously knew Robin Williams's name without having to look it up everybody of course because that's he's one of those performers that you're like yeah he i know who that is the film itself stars carrie elwes richard lewis roger rees amy yasbeck and dave chappelle in his film debut along with minor roles for state tracy ullman sir patrick stewart mel brooks and others this wasn't actually mel brooks first foray into the story of robin hood no no He produced a television series called When Things Were Rotten, which aired on ABC. Unsurprisingly, it was also a goofball comedy that relied heavily on pop culture gags. It only had a brief run on air. It was 13 episodes that garnered diminished ratings. But Dick Van Patten, who plays the Abbot in Men in Tights, starred in the TV show as Friar Tuck. Amazing. (laughs) That's one thing everybody knows about Mel Brooks is that he's very loyal to his people. Yeah. Similar to the Coen brothers, actually. Or Wes Anderson. Two actors who missed out on this movie were Madeline Kahn, frequent Brooks Brooks collaborator. She's so good. She is. And Sean Connery. Really? Really, really. I'm sorry, Mr. Brooks, I can't do your movie. Um, Khan, who was featured in Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, High Anxiety, and History of the World Part One, along with others, was originally offered the role of Latrine, but there were salary disputes. Brooks later said that he didn't cast her because the screen time was so limited, and that's that's why he didn't give it to her, because it just wasn't enough for her. Uh. Um, that role ended up going to Tracy Ullman. Sean Connery was in line to reprise his role from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 
the fiscally successful yet critically stale film starring Kevin Costner, uh, Connery wanted to reprise his role as King Richard, but do the entire thing in drag. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> it was a... Uh, I'd, I'd like to do this role, but um, can I wear a skirt? <laughs> They were going to go for it. They wanted to do it, but Connery wanted his salary to be a million dollars that he was going to donate to various Scottish charities, which isn't like, that's not a bad thing. And I think it would have been pretty funny. Yeah. But the budget just, just didn't, there was no room for it. When Brooks called Elwes to offer him the role, Elwes hung up on him because he thought he was being pranked. That's so good. <laughs> Is this Crank Yankers? <laughs> no, 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 we're serious. We're, we'd, I'd like to offer you the role. This is this is Mel Brooks. No, no, that's no. You're, no, you're Car- me. Carrie, don't be silly. This, like, I'm serious here. Do you want the? Do you want the role? That doesn't sound like a serious thing Mel Brooks would say. <laughs> Once Ella is actually answered the phone and took the part, <laughs> he got to assist in casting Robin's side chick. The uh, side chick. He got to assist in casting Robin's sidekick, a chew. And together, Brooks and Ellis said that they immediately knew J- Dave Chappelle was their guy as soon as they saw him. Yeah. This is also the first Brooks film not to feature himself in a leading role. Ooh. Yeah, he makes an appearance as Rabbi Tuckman, but it's a much smaller role than he usually has. With regards to Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves... The lackluster public reception was one of the reasons Men in Tights even got made. Oh wow! Um, so they were like, "You, you, are, you're you're good to make this movie because this one over here was a kind of a steaming pile." Basically, so what happened was uh, this guy named Evan Chandler uh, had a son named Jordan, and they were talking one day and. Evan, and here's here's the thing. Evan had not worked in the film industry before. Evan was a dentist. Okay. And I think knowing that, it makes sense why he was, hold on, he was grilling his son for, like, ideas. Grilling? Grilling. That was a thing back then. <laughs> <laughs> one of his clients, one of his dental clients was writer and producer J. David Shapiro. Oh, Okay. So Chandler and his son were talking about, like, what would be good movie ideas? That's the most terrifying thing I have ever heard. I'm just going to just, you know, just going to dig into your uh, mouth uh, here. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so we uh, were talking about some uh, good movie ideas. Uh-huh. And we think Robin uh, Hood would be good. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I don't know. But, uh, please uh, try not to talk. Uh, uh, just give me a nod if you're into uh, it. Uh, 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 please, please don't talk. Just nod. Uh, he nodded. He nodded. <laughs> hey, son. He nodded. <laughs> Jordan suggested to his father that the Prince of Thieves diverted, it deserved to be parodied. And then I can only assume that exactly what just transpired is what transpired. Chandler cornered Shapiro, and together they wrote the original screenplay, which was later picked up and revised by Brooks. I love that phrasing. He cornered him. He's like, "No, just let me. Just let me talk to you about this great idea I've got." Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm gonna finish putting this crown in, but. Speaking of crowns, Brooks wrote all of the original music from the movie, as he did with Springtime for Hitler for the producers and The Lounge Number from High High Anxiety, uh, along with many others. It's a thing that he does. But the love ballad that Robin sings to Marion, The Night is Young and You're So Beautiful, was... So some people, again, it's... The rest of us, people always think it's Sinatra. It it was covered by Dean Martin, but it was actually written in 1937 by Dana Sussy, Billy Rose, and Irving Call. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have for the first half. Okay. You want to go watch it? Let's go watch it. And we're back. We're back. So 
doesn't not all the jokes age super well. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. No, some of them shouldn't have been good in the first place. I feel like I had to have been watching the edited for TV version mostly when I was younger. Like I know I've seen the whole thing unedited before, but like it did not a lot of the stuff did not stick out to me the way some of it definitely does now. I have a lot of thoughts about this movie, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. No, go ahead. Oh my god, I hate this movie. <laughs> you had told me that well i didn't realize it i hadn't seen it in ages Mm -hmm. but i didn't realize how a there are a lot of really offensive jokes in this Mm -hmm. b the jokes that aren't offensive for the most part just don't land Mm -hmm. and c there's also a lot of other jokes taken from other mel brooks movies yeah Like, down to using Robert Ridgely as the lisping, eye-patched hangman from Blazing Saddles, and then they reference Blazing Saddles outright, say Blazing Saddles at the end. Yeah. It's, there's, it's, it was, the movie is painfully 90s. It's very 90s. And it just isn't good. I will grant that it hasn't aged well, but... I did enjoy it a lot at one point in time. That's fair. But I'm not saying like anyone who enjoys it has bad taste. They just have different tastes from me. So the royal announcer that I pointed out to you. Yes. Remember that guy. I just wanted to acknowledge the name of that human. His actual real for real life name is Clement von Frankenstein. Hold on. Yeah. Hold. Hold the phone. Clement Von Frankenstein. Yes. There's an extra C in Frankenstein, but... That is incredible. And also, it's it's Von Frankenstein, all one word. All one word. So, Clement Von Frankenstein. Yes. Oh, my God. That's astounding. I mean, it's, it's a shortening of his father's name, but his father's name was also essentially Von Frankenstein. Was his father's name Clementine von Frankensteinington? God, I wish so. I didn't write it down. Um, but he actually has a pretty okay rev- uh, resume. Yeah? He was in Death Becomes Her. Oh. Uh, Lionheart with John Fo- uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Van Damme. Van Damme. The American President and Hail Caesar. Oh, wow. All and, right. And that, like, that's far from the... Get it, von Frankenstein. At the time, in the early 90s, reviews for the film were mixed. Test audiences felt it was a good spoof, but not enough to launch a sequel, as is hinted at in the film itself. Rotten Tomatoes has it at a rating of 48%, which is about an average of 5.3 out of a possible 10. Despite the initial reviews, the film has developed a cult following, and that cult following holds up till this day. Brooks himself claims that Men in Tights and Spaceballs are his top-selling DVDs. They're my two least favorite Mel Brooks movies. <laughs> mm-hmm. It debuted at number six, but it never managed to break the top five because at the time it was competing with Coneheads, Hocus Pocus, Weekend at Bernie's 2, which for some reason, I think I've said this before, I loved Weekend at Bernie's 2. It took me many years before I ever even saw the first Weekend at Bernie's. Okay. I don't know. I just really enjoyed the second one. It was very funny to me. But That's fair. Apparently, my favorite things from the 90s aren't also so the total domestic take-in was 35 million seven hundred thirty nine three hundred and fifty five dollars which is about 61 million five hundred forty five three hundred sixty five dollars and eighty cents in today's money okay it had a budget of roughly 20 million so that's about a 44 percent profit margin nice so aside from the fact that the that the brooks theme uh, very largely in this movie is like pop culture anachronisms. There is actually one specific anachronism that I think they weren't expecting anybody to notice. The bridal chorus music in the wedding scene mm-hmm. is taken from Wagner's 1850 opera Longren. And the time setting is actually uh, several hundred years off from the typical setting of the mythology of Robin Hood, which is typically 13th or 14th century. Okay. Also, the guy who plays Will Scarlett O'Hara mm-hmm. actually went on to star in the BBC Adventures of uh, the New Adventures of Robin Hood. Nice. Yes. He was a 
He's a good looking dude. Uh, yes, actually, TV Tropes uh, credits him as being a real pretty boy. Nice. That's a trope. Pretty boy. Yep. I mean, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's about all I got. All right. Aside from uh, tropes. Well, let's dig into those tropes. So, Daniel. Kate. Where do tropes come from? Where do tropes come from? Yeah. How does a trope become a thing? It It's basically like a meme. It It's something that uh, like happens so frequently in stories that it becomes a mini theme in and of itself. Every meme has to start somewhere. Right. This film is actually responsible for the uh, founding and naming of two tropes. Ooh! What two tropes are those? Um... So the uh, bad news in a good way, as Rottingham tries to deliver to Prince John, mm-hmm. and then the just you and me and my guards. I like it. That's where both of those started. Nice. Twice there is a character filibuster. They're actually one right after the other. It's when Robin is speaking to the townspeople, and he kind of goes into that Winston Churchill thing, Mm -hmm. and then Achu uh, takes over and goes into a Malcolm X speech. I like it. Also, can we just take a minute to talk about how baby-faced Dave Chappelle was in this? Holy crap! It's it's Oh my goodness. Very, very baby face. Such a tiny little baby face. Such a tiny little Dave Chappelle face. The breaking of the fourth wall is... Rampant. Rampant. It's just, like that's just it. Yeah. Uh, there is a trope called a blade lock, where in a sword fight, the they kind of come to a standstill because they are so caught. And this one is subverted here because the battle between Robin Hood and Little John with the long sticks keeps they just keep snapping and getting smaller and smaller instead of leading them to a gridlock. The main song, Men in Tights, for which the movie is named is a badass boast. Okay. Which is a thing. Yeah. Apparently a thing. A trope. There's the award bait song, the Ballad of Marion. Um, Definitely presented in a this is a sweeping epic tale. Yes. Uh casual danger dialogue. Uh so pretty much anytime anything mildly dangerous is going on and Blinken comes in to talk to Robin. <laughs> the insistence on terminology exchange between King Richard and Rabbi Tuckman when King Richard calls the rabbi a uh, priest or father mm. uh, and the rabbi says rabbi and he's like yeah whatever, whatever. And he's, here's your knife sword yeah whatever I like it and re- just real quick uh, like I feel like they told Patrick Stewart we wanted Sean Connery <laughs> so Patrick Stewart was like okay I'll do my best Sean Connery then. I think that's probably fair. <laughs> and it was very good. <sighs> oh, I pointed this out to you while it was happening. The uh, What you, you pointed out as the uh, boob window. Yes. Um, the actual trope name for that is distracted by the sexy. Oh. Um. Mm-hmm. Another one that is subver- uh, subverted, not remembering the name, the proper name of, which is the whole point that we're supposed to be using TV tropes is to actually have the names. But it's uh, it's a subverted trope in this case because it's a use of shadows that animation, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, used to utilize shadows to hide any sort of grisly like death or people harming each other or like substance abuse or anything like that. Uh, to make it less of a negative impact on their intended audience. Right. Whereas when Robin is singing to Marion, the shadows that that are cast are unintentionally suggestive. Uh, So trope subverted. I like it. They definitely use sped up film a lot. They did. Um, That was another anachronism. The fox that they use it was actually a gray fox which is not indigenous to england oh no. also happy little bluebirds not indigenous, not indigenous to england indigenous. i love it the glove slap yes which i love uh rottingham slaps robin with his club and robin responds by picking up a armored glove hand and returning uh there is a greek chorus by way of the uh wrapping merry men they were they were something else. 
Uh, there is a trope called idiot ball, which is when a plot device that is it would be very, very stupid to follow comes up and whoever sees it runs it and grabs with it or grabs it and runs with it, uh, which would be Robin deciding that he's absolutely going to enter that archery competition because archery. Because archery. Mm-hmm. I think uh, there is a fair amount of absurdism oh, that absolutely. comes with really any Mel Brooks movie, but especially... Yes. Uh, in this one, there's there's a lot of mm-hmm. very absurd uh, in uh, as you know, which they use for a lot of their humor. Yeah, it's that and the fourth wall are like two of the things that I think all Brooks movies rely on the heaviest. Oh, and this one is probably my favorite: uh, the pirates who don't do anything. So Robin and his merry men, who allegedly exist to steal from the wit- rich and give to the poor. They don't actually do that at all. Yeah, we don't see any of that. Like, there's one small battle at the banquet, and then the one at the very end. And then everything else is just them kind of hanging out. <laughs> so the the rousing speech subverted, and then played straight in that order. And then just the shout-outs, which are the throwbacks to every other Brooks thing that you already pointed out. But uh, when Rabbi Tuckman says, oh, you Prince of Thieves, you... The hangman, the mole gag, the mole gag, which is a shout out to the the hump gag from Young Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. The let's see, uh, Will Scarlett O'Hara being from Georgia will make him an offer he can't refuse. That whole that whole bit. So uh, the cotton balls. Yes, I love this. So Dom DeLuise, as usual, my favorite part of this movie. I am a sucker for Dom DeLuise. <laughs> And he does such a good Marlon Brando in this movie. He does. And uh, they reference what one of, one of my favorite facts from uh, The Godfather, uh, you know, Rest in Peace, Lost episode. Someday uh, we're going to recreate it. Yes. But uh, Marlon Brando auditioned for the role in The Godfather with cotton balls in his mouth to get that voice, like, down. And obviously that is referenced in this when Dom DeLuise is like, oh, no, I'm sorry, I've got... I've it just got came from the it dentist. It just came from the dentist. I've got cotton balls in my mouth. <laughs> and takes them out. And it's great. That is, like, that was the, I think, the first, like, legit full laugh that I got from this movie. The folio depository. Oh, my God. The the shooter waiting out in the folio depository to try and assassinate Robin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also at the, the very, very end, spoiler, uh, Latrine gives, uh, Rottingham a magic pill that can save your life. It was a lifesaver's candy. Was it really? It really was. Oh my God. I never noticed it before. And I saw, it, I read that fact and I was looking for it this time. And I was like, oh my God. That is so <laughs> incredible. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Cause like they don't call attention to it. No. It's very subtle. Like you have to be looking right at t- Tracy Ullman's hand. In this translation, where Robin says, unlike um, other Robin Hoods, I can speak with an English accent, which is a dig at Costner and Prince of Thieves. Mm-hmm. In the Italian and French versions, Robin says, I'm not someone who dances with wolves. <laughs> and then the German version, he says that he doesn't cost, which is Kosten in German. He doesn't cost the producer several millions ah uh, nice so those were the the super super subtle digs that's great mm-hmm. the uh the last arrow that robin shoots at the tournament mm-hmm. is the patriot arrow right which was a comment on the patriot missiles at the time 90s reference 90s. heroes love redheads well because. i mean anyone with romantic attraction should love redheads <laughs> because because redheads. Redheads are great. Mm, we are. It's true. Yeah. So that's it. Nice. Nice so look out. It was definitely a, a fun experience <clears throat> getting to uh, digest that again from a very different viewpoint from when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes things shouldn't be gone back to and revisited. Yeah. You can never go home again. Don't mm-hmm. meet your heroes. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But anyway... But anyway. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, as always, you can find us on iTunes. Po- iTunes? iTunes. iTunes. Hey, Carly. 
You can find us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, Google Play now. We are officially up and running on Google Play. Basically, wh- wherever you Wherever find you your... get your podcasts. Blueberry. Blueberry. If you want to follow us on the social medias, on Instagram and Twitter, we are at Subverted Tropes. And you can find us on Facebook at the Subverted Tropes podcast page. If you want to send us a message without going through those pesky DMs, you can email us at subvertedtropecast at gmail.com. As always, we've got our blog. We release a uh, blog post with each episode. That is at subvertedtropecast.wordpress.com. And our fantastic blogger, Kate, does an, an amazing job with uh, the write-ups. And it's mostly pictures. It's a lot of good pictures. And a huge thank you to Gracie Boland uh, for our amazing logo. And you can find her on YouTube and Instagram at A Modern Unicorn. She is just a delight. So She's, she's wonderful, and uh, last week was her birthday. So if you've actually listened to us and gone and checked her out, tell her happy birthday because she's wonderful and she deserves it. Exactly. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you next month. We know we're oh, having some guests. Yeah, next month. Let's we're just. Not, we're not. Should do it? Should, should we? Should we run down the list? I think we should run down the Let's list real quick. List. So we've got guests from other podcasts coming to join us this uh, this next month in June. We've got the historical hotties hosts, uh, the Nelson sisters. Mm-hmm. We've got Lindsay and Jordan Reed from Spooky Spouses who are going to be joining us. Mm -hmm. And then we've got uh, Joe from Spoilers Digest. Yes. Uh, And if you haven't heard those podcasts, you should go listen to all of those because they're fantastic. Also, another couple quick podcast shout outs because why not? You can go listen to Guess What You're Going to Hate. Uh, I recently did a guest spot on that on their episode, Keeping Up with the Bluths. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I talk about Arrested Development for a bit. Yeah. And Kate, you, I mean, it was a... It was a couple weeks back. A couple weeks back. I guessed it on Back to the Futurama, discussing the last episode of the original Fox run of Futurama, The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings. And coming up in June, we are both going to join the historical hotties again. That's right. Also... So in a couple of days, uh, you'll be able to find uh, the episode that I just recorded for the podcast Broad Pod, which talks about Broad City. And is made up of a couple of local North Carolina comedians who are fantastic and fun. Wonderful. Yes. And even if you don't listen to Broad City, you can listen to the show because we do very little talking actually about the episode of Broad City. <laughs> uh, we mostly just talk about crazy things that have happened in our lives. So... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of great podcasts out there to listen to. Thank you so much for listening to this one. And, uh, we would strongly recommend that you check out some of our friends. Yeah. And if you would, you know, give us a like, give give us a rating, subscribe, give us a comment. Let us know how we're doing. If you want us to do something new or go outside our box or whatever, let us know. We'll try. We'll do our best. That's right. All right. All right. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you next time. Bye.